Ron, thank you very much indeed. I'm delighted to be asked to give an update on where we are with the delivery of, of, of David's review. I appreciate that there's a great deal of interest in, in this, so hopefully we can shed a little light this afternoon. Why did we have a review? Well, from the service point of view, there was a general feeling that the current configuration of the medical workforce was not fit for purpose. David's outlined some of the reasons why. But everyone will be aware we have severe challenges in primary care, severe challenges on scheduled care, and a general perception that all the reviews we've had in the past have left off with too many chiefs and nobody left to do the work. So it's the, in that background that we receive the review. I'm going to cut straight to the chase. Where are we now with the review? It was received and considered by the four ministers in November. It was broadly welcomed in all four countries, cautiously so, because I think there is an awareness that this is a big change. This will be a, a, a big a task to implement. And in the civil service jargon, officials have been instructed to consider the document and to draw up appropriate advice and policies. So that's what we're doing on a four UK basis. We see this as a framework, not a rigid document, uh, and therefore it's open to a degree of interpretation. The key messages we have taken from the document, you've heard, we're looking at doctors with more general skills, trained more quickly. We still require some specialists. We need a more flexible training, and we'll expand on that in a moment. I've highlighted, however, one big aspect of the recommendation, which is that training requires to respond to the needs of patients and the service and not be an end in itself. And I think that's a new dimension for us. Perhaps tease that out. The training is going to be shorter. It's going to have to be of higher quality. And the big thing for the four departments is this concept of blurring the primary secondary care interface. And I want to say a bit more about that. Moving registration to the point of graduation, I'm going to say a little bit about, and the creation of a UK delivery group. We have a UK four-nation delivery group set up earlier this year. These are the broad, broad remits. Essentially, it's going to report to ministers and obtain approval of ministers for implementation and determine the policy. It's chaired and will be chaired by the four UK nations, and currently the lead of the Scottish Government, which is why I'm currently chairing the group. If we simplify the proposed changes to shape of training, I think they can be simplified to this. There'll be an undergraduate period, foundation period, and then this general training period of four to six years, and that will create the trained doctor of the future, the doctor with a specialist certificate of training, Registration, as proposed, will move to the point of graduation, and then there'll be an opportunity for credentialing, which can anything from one to three years. So that gives us three points to consider. Registration, the trained doctor of the future, and the credentialed doctor. So perhaps I can share some of that thinking. As David said, Moving the point of graduation was all, a point of registration to graduation was already a live issue with the four governments. We'd already been discussing this in some detail. Why is it proposed? Essentially because of the increasing graduate numbers. It's really as simple as that. And the limit to the number of foundation places we can create. We've got private medical schools around the corner, overseas medical schools. And finally, the universities are expressing concern about their governance over that first year of foundation training because these doctors are away from university oversight and with employers. But the challenges are substantial. And we've not come to a conclusion about this, I can tell you. The report says means are in place to demonstrate graduates are up to date and fit to practice. We absolutely buy into that. But that challenges the undergraduate curriculum. Undergraduate curricula are already full. And uh, under, universities, although they're moving towards producing a graduate that's more fit to go straight to work, they're certainly not there. And the medical schools will need to be of a more uniform standard. And that's a bit of a challenge to them too. And it might even bring on a single final exam, a UK single final exam. Because we're then going to have to have an entrance 
proposal to the foundation training, and that's not been defined. How will that be done? Will it be done by employers? Will it be ranking of a UK final, ex uh, a UK undergraduate exam? There's much to tease out. And however it's done, inevitably there will be medical graduate unemployment. Clearly people who don't enter the foundation training will find other routes to work, but the reality is many will not. So we're giving that consideration and further work has been commissioned by the four departments and it's likely this decision will be made out with the shape of training review. Briefly, the trained doctor, I guess this is the most innovative and potentially the most contentious theme. We're looking at training in general themes. And while I appreciate I'm talking to a surgical audience, this I think is very attractive for some other areas in medicine which I'll perhaps also tease out briefly. So these are some of the proposed themes. They're by no means laid down. Surgery, medicine, women and children's, mental health, diagnostics, anaesthetics, and a very interesting proposal about community medicine stroke primary care. The proportion of work that these doctors will undertake that's currently undertaken by consultants today has not been determined and will require to be modelled if this is to go forward. And the flexibility, and we're very attracted by the flexibility, especially in non-craft disciplines. You can see huge flexibility between primary care training, general medicine, mental health, uh, pediatrics, and so on. The potential benefits, shorter training will create more doctors. They will, we have to determine how much work they will undertake. It provides solutions for seven-day service, unscheduled care. Solutions for work-life balance requirement, which the trainees of today want, and the feminization of the workforce. It also provides career opportunities for our current SES doctors. So the four departments are greatly attracted by many of these proposals. The third option, the credential doctor. I think we don't know much about this. We have much to tease out as to what this would mean in terms of policy. How will they be selected? Will it be a formal training program with educational supervision? Is it an apprenticeship? Is it something else? It will be very presumably. Will there be an exam? Will there not? And I think the big question is how does the service determine what the credential doctor will do and how many do we need? So that all needs to be teased out. But what I think is likely is it will differ between specialties. Now, this may or may not be good news for the people in this room because we would envisage that there will be specialties and areas where almost everyone will require to credential. Off the top of my head, I might quote neurosurgery. You would imagine that most doctors in neurosurgery will need to credential. And there may be specialties where relatively few, mainly the non-craft specialties. But there will be variability. We're especially attracted by the blurring of the primary care, secondary care interface. Those of you who read the Telegraph will see the big spread yesterday predicting a meltdown in primary care. Uh, and it's certainly an area that all governments see huge pressure uh, at present. This is an area where we would like to see innovative thinking. Currently, there's a proposal from the College of General Practitioners for a fourth year, formalized fourth year of training which may well incorporate aspects of secondary care which can be repatriated to the community. Things like community child health, mental health services, and so on. Uh, may well be some aspects of surgery too uh, with our primary care colleagues. So this has been agreed that this will be a, an early work stream in terms of any delivery of shape of training. There's also been a proposal that, in fact, one of the basic themes could be primary care stroke community care, and that's a notion that's gaining some traction. And you can see how that would work, that there'd be considerable overlap between general medicine, between pediatrics, mental health, and we create a workforce that can work both in secondary and primary care. And I think with the delivery of that kind of concept, we truly would have delivered David's vision uh, for that aspect of the service. So the next steps, 
as Ron said, we have a four-nation UK steering group. Much work has actually been done. We've done a lot of thinking about this to date. Uh, in all fairness, I, I'm not reviewing all of that today for reasons that would be clear. But we meet again in May when some decisions will be made and some proposals that will be discussed. We're going to agree general principles for the implementation uh, of, of the policy. Uh, one of these will be that these require to be educationally supervised and have educational quality, both the training of the new trained doctor and the credential doctor. We then have to consider whether we do have a policy which is sufficiently clear and sufficiently robust to take to the health ministers in the four nations, and that policy has to be agreed. So we'll discuss that. I think you can take it that we think there's some work that might need to be done. I think there will require to be a little clarity in some areas, and I've, I've highlighted one or two of those today. One of the things we have to consider is whether aspects of the review could commence now so that we don't uh, have any further delay. Maybe that that primary care area would be an area that we could move. And there will unequivocally be an instruction to ministers and from ministers that there will be a cost-benefit analysis of the policy proposal before we fire the big starting gun. So that's where we are. I hope it gives you an idea of where we've got to. But it's not that nothing has been happening. Lots, has been ha lots of things have been happening. And hopefully there'll be further news in the relatively near future. Thank you very much.